All right, welcome back to the listener's commentary on the letter of 2 Timothy. In this recording, we're going to be looking at 2 Timothy chapter 2, verses 1 through 13. And to keep that in context, we need to remember where we're at in the letter. And the most important thing for us to remember is that this is a personal letter from Paul and Timothy, Timothy whom he calls his dear son in the faith, Timothy, who is his closest colleague in ministry, they've worked together for over 15 years. That's who this letter is to. And in the preceding sections, Paul has given his introduction and greetings in verses 1 and 2 of chapter 1, and then he proceeded to provide a thanksgiving and an encouragement to Timothy. Paul thanks God for Timothy as he reflects on Timothy's genuine faith, And what he does is he calls Timothy from that to fan into flame his gift that was given to him for the sake of ministry. And this is what Paul wants Timothy to do as a result of fanning that gift into flame. He tells him, don't be ashamed of Paul and of the gospel. He wants him to join in suffering with Paul for the sake of the gospel. He wants Timothy to hold on to the pattern of sound teaching and to protect what he calls the good deposit through God's Spirit. And he reminds Timothy that there have been many people that haven't been faithful like that. And even though Paul, even though that's the case, Paul knows Timothy is full of genuine faith. And so he encourages him to live that out in this way by fanning to flame his gift and doing these sorts of things. So now, as we begin chapter 2 and look at this section here in 2, 1 through 13, what Paul does is he calls Timothy to be strong, to entrust the faith to others, and to suffer hardship for the sake of Jesus. Here's the way chapter 2 begins. He says, you therefore, notice the therefore, which connects us to all the preceding stuff, the preceding stuff about fanning into flame and suffering for the gospel and not being ashamed of it and protecting the good deposit and being faithful even though others haven't been. You therefore, my son, be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. And this, uh, in, this verb, be strong, is in the present tense in Greek, which emphasizes continuous action. He, in other words, not just be strong once, like continually, every morning when you wake up, every day as you go about your life in ministry, be strong. And be strong specifically in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. And what Paul seems to be referring to by that phrase is everything that is entailed in Jesus, everything that Jesus has achieved and accomplished and taught and done. And it reminds us, by stating it this way, that all of that is a result of grace. And it focuses our attention on what we have in Jesus is a gift of grace. And so, as an all-encompassing descriptive phrase, it captures the message about Jesus and the sound teaching that's about Jesus' ways and the life that we have in Jesus. And all of that can be described here, in short, as grace. And there are three things that Paul wants Timothy to do as part of being strong in the grace of Jesus Christ. And the first thing he wants him to do is to pass on the faith. Look at verse 2. He says, the things, so be strong in the grace that's in Jesus, the things which you have heard from me in the presence of many witnesses, entrust these to faithful people who will be able to teach others also. And here, Paul is calling Timothy to pass on what Timothy himself has heard from Paul. The gospel and the sound teaching that Timothy has received, he is to pass that on to other faithful people. And those faithful people, it's not just that they're able to teach. That's the way it's translated here. But it would be more accurate to translate it as competent. This particular verb has more the sense of competent or qualified. Not just that they're they're able to, but they're the kind of people who can competently pass this on. And this really describes the fundamental pattern of how the faith gets passed on from one person to the next and from one generation to the next. Notice what we have here. We have Paul passing it on to Timothy. Timothy is supposed to pass it on to faithful people. 
And those faithful people then are supposed to take what they hear from Timothy and pass that on to others also. And so we have like four spiritual generations, four generations of faith. And in terms of discipleship and disciple making, this is what we aim for. We aim to pass on the faith to faithful people who can pass on the faith to others and so on down the line. So the first thing that Paul wants Timothy to do as part of being strong in the grace of Jesus is to pass on the faith. And second, Paul then calls Timothy to do this even though it might be hard. And so he says in verse 3, suffer hardship with me as a good soldier of Christ Jesus. And recall that in chapter 1, Paul urges Timothy to fan into flame his gift. And that will entail not being ashamed of the gospel. And it will also entail suffering for the gospel. And so here Paul really restates that by saying, suffer hardship with me and do so as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. And this really is a major objective of this letter to Timothy, to encourage Timothy and bolster him to stand firm, right? To, to strengthen him and give him the fortitude to endure hardship for Jesus. And remember that when he talks about Jesus here, he says, as a good soldier of Christ Jesus. In that phrase, Christ Jesus, we've got to remember that Christ doesn't mean like uh, his first name. It's, it's a title and it refers to Jesus as king. And so be a good soldier of Christ Jesus is to serve him faithfully as your king. And that's what Paul calls Timothy to do here in verse 3. Then he provides three illustrations from everyday life to spur Timothy on to endurance and to encourage him as he suffers for Jesus. And each of these illustrations really highlights, it seems to me, a different aspect of faithful service for Timothy and, by extension, for us. And so the first illustration, playing off of what he just said, is a soldier. Look what he says in verse 4. No soldier. So uh, suffer hardship with me as a good soldier... No soldier in active service entangles himself in the affairs of everyday life so that he may please the one who enlisted him. And the key idea here is this idea of entangling yourself, entangles himself in civilian affairs. In other words, he stays at his post. He doesn't get distracted by or involved in matters unrelated to his commanding orders from his king. And thus, his manner of life is by by necessity going to look very different because he's committed to serving his commander as a good soldier. And that's what Timothy is being called to do. No soldier in active service actually gets involved in the stuff of civilian life and everyday affairs. He stays focused, undistracted, at his post, on task to honor his commanding officer, in this case, King Jesus. And this reminds us that suffering hardship for Christ really does place limitations on our life. There are certain things we can do, and it's going to affect how we spend our time, things like that. And Timothy and us, well, we are in active service to King Jesus, and so we've got to make sure we don't get entangled in civilian affairs, that we stay focused on the matters that the king wants us to focus on. We stay focused on the orders he has given us. So that's illustration number one. Uh, be a good soldier. Next up in verse five comes example number two. This one is an athlete. Look what he says in verse five. He says, if someone likewise competes as an athlete, he's not crowned as a victor unless he competes according to the rules. And so here, Christian living and Christian service is pictured as an athletic contest with the training and the strenuous effort that's involved in athletic work and athletic competitions. And the focus here is on competing according to the rules. You can't be crowned a victor. This word literally is just crown. They've supplied as victor to clarify here in the translation because there's two different words for crown in Greek. There's the royal crown that a ruler wears, but then there's the victor's crown that someone gets in their culture for winning some sort of competition. That's the word we have here. So they've supplied that just to clarify for us that you can't be crowned as a victor. You can't receive the gold medal. You can't uh, hoist the victor's trophy unless you compete 
according to the rules. You can't cheat, right? You can't do your own things. You can't play the game your own way. You have to compete according to the rules or else you get disqualified. And this reminds us that suffering hardship for Christ is struggling according to the pattern that Christ gave us. We don't get to make up the rules for ourselves. We don't get to do it our own way. So the teaching of Jesus and the pattern of the cross have to be followed. That's our way. That's our pattern. It has to be followed in order to wear the victor's crown. And then in verse 6, he gives the third example, and this one is of a farmer. And so he says this, the hardworking farmer ought to be the first to receive his share of the crops. And the focus here is on the phrase hardworking. And that focuses our attention on uh, discipline and endurance. A hardworking farmer is the one who gets up early and stays up late during planting season. He continues to care for the ground and plants during the growing season, waiting for the crops to grow, waiting for them to come to maturity. And then finally, during harvest season, now he has to work really hard, 24 hours a day almost, right? Seven days a week, he's got to get the crops in before they go bad. And so he's hardworking. And this reminds us that suffering hardship for Christ requires discipline and endurance. And all three of these images, the soldier, the athlete, the farmer, they all show us that Christian living and Christian service is not a casual, easygoing, kind of fly-by-night, do-what-you-want sort of affair. Um, that Christian living and Christian service uh, is not necessarily you know, looking for a fun, entertaining time. It is undistracted, strenuous, uh, disciplined effort over the long haul. That's what, what Paul is calling Timothy to, and by extension, that's what he's calling all of us who would serve Christ faithfully to. Paul says in verse 7, he says, consider what I say. That is, reflect on it, think about it, imagine it, uh, Picture it. Consider what I say, Timothy, for the Lord will give you understanding in everything. And remember, we're writing a personal letter between Paul and Timothy. So Timothy is the first focus, and that's why the you here in verse 7 is singular. Consider what I say, Timothy, for the Lord will give you, Timothy, understanding. This is a call for Timothy to reflect on and meditate on the various pictures that Paul's just given. The picture of the soldier, the picture of the athlete, the picture of the farmer. Meditate on them. Now, even though this is written initially and originally to Timothy, it's included here for us. And we too must reflect on it and meditate on it and take these images to heart and examine our living in light of them as well. So the first thing Paul wants Timothy to do as part of being strong in the grace of Jesus Christ is to pass on the faith to others. The second thing he wants Timothy to do is to suffer hardship, just like Paul does as a good soldier of King Jesus. And now finally, the third thing he wants him to do is he wants him to remember Jesus which really means remember the entire gospel story about Jesus. And Paul is going to summarize that here in the next couple of verses. And so he says in verse 8, remember Jesus Christ. That is not just remember him as of, oh yeah, I kind of forgot him. It means really keep your focus on him. Keep your mind in the game, right? Keep your, your eyes on Jesus and the gospel. Remember Jesus Christ, risen from the dead, descendant of David, according to my gospel. And this really is a very brief encapsulation of the gospel that Paul gives us here. Because the gospel, sometimes we make this mistake of thinking the gospel is, is a plan of salvation, but that's not quite right. What the gospel actually is in the New Testament, the gospel is the news about Jesus Christ. That's the gospel. Our response to that is what leads us then into new life and into salvation. But the gospel itself is news. That's the meaning of the word gospel, good news. And so what Paul gives us here is a very brief encapsulation of the gospel. Remember Jesus Christ, Jesus the Messiah, Jesus the King, 
risen from the dead. That's the centerpiece of the gospel. As Paul argues in 1 Corinthians 15 and plenty of other places that without the resurrection, there is no gospel. Jesus is not king and we have no hope. So remember Jesus Christ, risen from the dead, descendant of David. Why does that get thrown in here? Well, because that means he can be king. He, he's of the right lineage to actually be the Messiah and the king. He is of David's lineage. And God had made the promise to David that he would have a, a descendant sit on his throne forever and ever. And Jesus is the one that fulfills that. So remember this, Paul says, according to my gospel. Now, Paul actually has a very similar summary of this same encapsulation of the gospel in the beginning of the book of Romans, Romans 1, 3, and 4. Listen to what Paul says there. He says, uh, concerning his son who was born a, of a descendant of David according to the flesh, who was declared the son of God with power uh, according to the spirit of holiness by the resurrection from the dead, Jesus Christ our Lord. And so this this is a common way for Paul to kind of summarize in brief, in a nutshell, the gospel message, the good news about Jesus, the Messiah, risen from the dead, uh, according to the promises given to uh, the people of Israel, all the way back to David and before that as well. And so Paul wants Timothy to remember this, to to hold this before his mind on a daily basis. This is who he lives for. This is who he suffers for. Um, this is the message that is going to give Timothy strength to go about his ministry and his life. And Paul's an example of that. Paul's an example of this kind of being strong and of suffering for this message. And so Paul continues in verse 9 saying, For which, that is for the gospel, for this message about Jesus, for which... I suffer hardship even to imprisonment as a criminal, but the word of God is not imprisoned. This is Paul's current situation. And so he's calling Timothy to suffer hardship. And Paul's like, guess what? That's been my lot. That's my role. I'm suffering hardship. I'm even doing it to the point of imprisonment and not just any imprisonment. I'm doing it imprisonment as a criminal. Like I'm being treated like a common criminal and suffering the indignity and the shame and the disgrace that goes along with that. But here's the thing, he says, the word of God is still not in prison. And so Paul continues in verse 10, describing why he does it this way, why he lives this way. He says, for this reason, I endure all things for the sake of those who are chosen. That is for, for God's chosen people, the elect, those who have come into Christ and now are part of God's new family in Jesus. Paul says, I endure all things for their sake so that they also may obtain the salvation which is in Christ Jesus with its eternal glory. And Paul's like, I remember this about Jesus. I suffer for him so that other people can enjoy the benefits of knowing Jesus and re receiving the salvation that he offers and looking forward to the eternal glory that it promises. And then Paul ends this little section with a short little poetic piece that actually appears aimed at encouraging and inspiring that kind of fortitude and resolve in Timothy and in us. Like Paul has shown this fortitude. Paul has shown this resolve to suffer hardship and to do it over the long haul. He has his mind focused on Jesus. He has his, art, his heart given to those who might be saved through his ministry. And Paul wants Timothy and us to have that same kind of fortitude and resolve. And so this little poetic piece seems aimed at inspiring such in us. And so Paul writes, this statement is trustworthy. For if we died with him, we will also live with him. If we endure, we will also reign with him. If we deny him, he will also deny us. If we're faithless, he remains faithful, for he cannot deny himself. Now, whether this was a a little poetic piece that Paul himself wrote at this moment for this time, whether this was sort of a common way of uh, encouraging people, like kind of something that the early church said and used as part of their services or in other times to build each other up and encourage each other. We don't know 100% for certain, but it shows up here. And in this context, notice it begins with four. It's, it's really giving a reason, giving a basis for, for Timothy to stand firm, to be faithful, even in the face of hardship and suffering. 
And let's take each line and make sure we understand what Paul is saying in each. And so he begins by saying, for if we died with him, we will also live with him. This refers to our entering into Christ Jesus. For example, Romans chapter 6, where Paul says that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus have been baptized into his death. We've been buried with him, Paul says there in Romans 6, through baptism into death, so that just as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, so we too could walk in newness of life. That seems to be what Paul is getting at by this line here. If we died with him when we entered into Christ and when we were baptized into his death, and then we came out of that um, embodying a spiritual resurrection so that we could walk in newness of life. In fact, Paul says there in Romans 6 verse 5, if we have become united with him in the likeness of his death, certainly we shall also be in the likeness of his resurrection. And that seems to be what Paul is getting at here with this line. And then the second line of this piece is, if we endure, if we endure faithfully serving him, we will also reign with him. So enduring hardships now leads to reigning with Christ later. And again, this is all throughout the New Testament and all throughout Paul's writings. Paul says in Romans chapter 8 that the Spirit himself testifies with our spirit that we're the children of God and of children, heirs also, heirs of God and fellow heirs of Christ, if indeed we suffer with him, so that we might also be glorified with him, right? Like suffering with him leads to being glorified with him. Or as James puts it in James chapter 1, verse 12, blessed is the man who perseveres under trial, for once he has been approved, he will receive the crown of life, which the Lord has promised to those who love him. And so if we endure faithfully, will also reign with him in the future. And then comes the warning, the next line. If we deny him, he will also deny us. Really, this is the counterpoint to the previous line. If instead of enduring, we turn faithless and deny Christ, well, he will deny us. And I think of two things when I read this line. The first is Jesus' words in Matthew chapter 10, verses 32 and 33, where Jesus says, Therefore, Everyone who confesses me before people, I will also confess him before my Father who is in heaven. But whoever denies me before people, I will also deny him before my Father who is in heaven. And so Paul is really just capturing the very words of Jesus there in Matthew chapter 10. The other thing I think of is the case of Peter, who denied famously, right, denied Jesus three times on the very night that Jesus was uh, arrested and undergoing trial and had been betrayed Peter denied him, but Peter also got a second opportunity. He got a chance to, to uh, um, be welcomed back in, right? And Jesus uh, restored him. And Peter famously becomes the first spokesman of the church on the day of Pentecost. And so uh, denying Jesus on an occasion doesn't mean we're going to be denied forever. That's the point I think of there with Peter's example. But if uh, it becomes the pattern of our life and the character of our life. And if we uh, decide that we're not going to be faithful to Jesus and we completely reject him, well, he'll deny us as well, as Jesus himself said. And then Paul ends this little piece by saying, if we are faithless, he remains faithful because he cannot deny himself. In other words, God is going to carry through on his promises in spite of the faithlessness of some who walk away from Christ, who don't endure faithfully to the end. God's still going to keep his word, and he's going to do what he said. In Paul's immediate situation, and really the immediate context, therefore, of this very moment in the letter, this has been a practical reality. Paul has seen some of the people that he's worked with and that he's known deny Jesus and no longer keep the faith. In fact, Paul ended the previous paragraph at the end of chapter 1 by highlighting some who did just that. But such faithlessness will not stop God's word or God's work from going forward. And for the faithful, those who do remain faithful, that's actually good news. That just because some people are faithless doesn't mean it's going to stop God. That's good news. But for the faithless, that's actually a warning. And why is all this the case? Why will this not keep God from accomplishing his promises? Because God can't deny himself. He's going to be true to himself. He's the faithful God. It's just who he is. And so he will carry out his work and his promises, whether we are faithful or not. 
Now, as we wrap up this section, let me just offer um, a simple little reflection. The, the main question being addressed in this uh, paragraph here is, what does Paul want Timothy, and therefore us, to do? And the answer is, be strong. Be strong in the graces in Jesus. That's what he wants him to do in short. And that involves faithfully passing on the gospel with discipline and perseverance, even when it's hard. That's what Paul wants Timothy to do. That's the call to Timothy here. And that's the call to us here, to be strong. Um, that we need to focus our attention on discipleship over the long haul. As Eugene Peterson put it in his very well-known line, that following Jesus is a long obedience in the same direction. And that takes discipline. That takes fortitude. That takes endurance, like a soldier or an athlete or a farmer, because if we endure with him now, we'll also reign with him forever and ever later. And that, my friends, is good news. All right, thanks for tuning into this session on the Listener's Commentary. The Listener's Commentary is a listener-supported, crowd-funded Bible teaching ministry that's made possible by the generous support of people just like you. So thanks a ton to those of you who make this ministry possible. Thanks a ton for the impact that this ministry, through your generosity, is having all around the world. And if you want to join the team of supporters, there's really two good ways to do that. Swing over to listenerscommentary.com, and you can click the Give button, probably the easiest way. It'll take you to a page uh, where you can put in a dollar amount, click a little box that says Make This Monthly, and all those donations go through a registered nonprofit called World Family Mission, or... You can sign up for the Study Hub, give whatever you can afford there. And either way, all monthly donors get access to the Study Hub, which includes some online courses. In fact, I'm working on adding another one here, hopefully later this year or early next year. Uh, there's some maps and charts and overviews of the books, and I'm constantly adding more material. A lot of work uh, putting stuff together for that, constantly adding more material, but all monthly donors get access to that. So let me say in advance, thanks a ton for your support.